and going around and around and around the same stupid mountains, that means you have a problem, you behave the same way. You have a problem, you get depressed. You have a problem, you get discouraged. You have a problem, you stop going to church, you stop giving, you stop helping anybody. Why, God, why? When, God, when? Why, God, why? All right, I'm teaching on wilderness mentalities this weekend. Wrong mindsets can keep you in bondage. Wrong thoughts and wrong attitudes can keep you in bondage. I'm sure you've heard the statement, your attitude determines your altitude. Well, really what that means is, depending on your attitude, that's how far you can go in life. It's amazing how we can make our own life very pleasant and enjoyable by having a good attitude in every situation and how our life, although our circumstances can be good if a person has a bad attitude, then they're not going to enjoy their life no matter what they have. Your attitude is very important and the devil may, may be able to take a lot of things away from you. People may be able to take a lot of things away from you, but the one thing nobody can take away from you is a good attitude and good thoughts if you decide to have them. Your attitude belongs to you, and it really determines your peace, your joy, how you function with people, the way you, the way you think determines your relationships. And so I want you to think about what you're thinking about, and I want you to take a truthful inventory of your attitude. Now, wilderness mentality number five. Don't make me wait for anything because I deserve everything right now. A <laughs> little bit of pride in that because pride says, well, why should I have to work? wait? I deserve, I deserve, I deserve. Humility, on the other hand, which is the attitude that Christ had and the one that we're encouraged to have in Philippians 2, says, I would like to have it now, but I trust God to do what's right for me in His timing. You know how much peace that brings you right away? I'd like to have it now, but I trust God to bring to me what I want in His timing if it's right for me, and if it's not right for me, I don't want it anyway. Are you hearing me? See, some of you just aren't enjoying the journey because you don't know how to enjoy where you're at on the way to where you're going. I would like to give you understanding tonight that you spend more time in your life waiting than you spend doing anything else. So you need to learn how to wait well. How many of you are waiting on something right now? Well, look at that. Well, I'll be happy when, well, I'll be happy when, well, I'll be happy when. <laughs> well, what about now? Why not go ahead and be happy now? You being unhappy is not going to hurry God up. If anything, if anything's going to hurry God, it's going to be a good attitude. Because when we have a good attitude, that kind of shows Him that we're mature enough to have the thing that we're asking Him for. I really want all of us here, and I'm reminding myself and the people who watch by television and listen by whatever format you listen by, or if you're watching on your computer, Please understand that your attitude belongs to you, and you can have a good one if you want to. Your attitude belongs to you, and you can have a good one if you want to. Amen? God loves you, and He loves you unconditionally. He loves you everlastingly. He wants to have an intimate, personal relationship with you. And God wants good things for you in your life. He's got a good plan for your life. But you can't even really have an intimate relationship with God if you've got a bad attitude. Because He does not have a bad attitude. We enter His gates with thanksgiving. And we come into His courts with praise. You don't come in through murmuring and grumbling and presenting your list of 25 things you have to have to even stay saved today? <laughs> Come on now. So attitude is very important. Numbers 21, we see in verses 4 through 6 that they just had 
a bad attitude. They didn't want to wait for anything, the Israelites. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient. <laughs> they wanted it right now, right now, right now. They got depressed and they got very discouraged because of the trials of the way. Just giving you a little refreshing on their attitude. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no water, neither is there no bread, neither is there any water. And we are, we hate this light, contemptible, unsubstantial manna. Then the Lord <laughs> sent fiery burning serpents among the people. And they bit the people. And many of the Israelites died. Next verse. And the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. <laughs> well, it's a shame we didn't just follow God's advice to start with and not have to get into that mess before we realized that things weren't going too well for us. Now, I'm glad that we live in the dispensation of grace and that hopefully we won't drop dead from murmuring, grumbling, and complaining. But nonetheless, I think that there is death that comes to us. It may not be us not breathing, but I think we lose our joy, and that's death. I think we lose our peace, and that's death. I think when we're grumbly and grouchy, nobody really wants to have relationship with us, and that's a part of death. So it may be a little different under the new covenant, but nonetheless, we're not going to enjoy the blessings of God unless we have a good attitude even when we're not getting things the way we want it. Amen? When we don't get things when we want them, the way we want them, God is training us and teaching us spiritually. The Bible tells us what to do in trouble in two scriptures. John 16, 33, cheer up. John 14, 27, calm down. <laughs> John 14, 27, Jesus said, my peace I leave with you, not as the world gives do I give unto you. Don't let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourselves to be agitated, fearful, and unsettled. Calm down. John 16, 33, in the world you will have tribulation. Cheer up! I have overcome the world. You have a problem? I have your answer. Calm down, cheer up. I call it the one-two punch for the enemy. Calm down, cheer up. Now what are you going to do? You can't take my peace. You can't take my joy. I can wait and enjoy my life while I wait. How many of you needed that one? <laughs> so be patient, brethren, as you wait. Doesn't say if you wait. You will wait. And whenever you get what it is you're waiting for now, most of you said you're waiting for something. When you get it, it won't be very many sunrises until you'll be waiting for something else. <laughs> so be patient, brethren, as you wait till the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits expectantly for the precious harvest from the land. See how he keeps up his patient vigil over it. Well, just like a farmer has a vigil, he does things. He plants the seed, he waters the seed, he keeps the weeds away. He watches over it to make sure that the birds don't come and eat the seed, tear up his garden. And he does that day after day after day, all the while believing for something he doesn't see. He believes that through planting seed and keeping up that patient vigil. See, the Bible says, as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest. But I think that needs to be said a different way. As long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and more time 
and time and time and time and then harvest amen the farmer puts his seed in the ground and he waits but he doesn't go out there every day well I am so depressed because my crop has not come in yet I'm so discouraged nothing good ever happens to me he keeps up his patient vigil and he waits and he waits and you know what there's even times when a farmer's crop is ruined even when it's gotten really nice it's ruined what does he do he plants again next year and we have to learn to be patient and keep up our vigil over our dreams you say what is that vigil I believe when you have a dream you sow a seed of faith you sow the Word of God you sow financially as God tells you to you be good to other people you keep a good positive confession you stay patient sweet and nice while you wait and I can pretty much tell you that there's no way the devil can keep you from getting what God wants you to have because those things just work they absolutely work I want to say again to you tonight many times learn how to enjoy where you're at on the way to where you're going I guess we all have some regrets when we look back and I don't believe much in regret so I don't mess with it too much but there are some things to contemplate once in a while that we wish we would have done a different way just to keep ourselves fresh and knowing not to do it again and one of the things that I do regret is that I didn't have this message when I needed it I needed somebody to preach this to me to tell me that I was going to have to wait that it was part of life and that God expected me to have a good attitude while I waited and he expected me to love other people while I waited and not to get grouchy and cranky just because I wasn't getting my way and think that that was pleasing to God I needed somebody to say to me Joyce you're going to spend a lot of time in life waiting so enjoy where you're at right now don't just wait to enjoy when but enjoy right now I didn't have anybody to tell me those things that I'm telling you tonight but I want to really impress on you to make a decision those of you here those watching by TV don't you waste one more day of your life in a lousy bad stinking attitude what if this were the last day you had wouldn't it be a shame to spend it sad enjoy where you're at on the way to where you're going enjoy yourself you never get away from yourself so you should start enjoying yourself <laughs> everywhere you go there you are enjoy yourself <laughs> have a good relationship with yourself get along good with yourself love yourself in a balanced way enjoy the wait now hearing me say it is a little bit easier than doing it it's easier to say amen amen you're good clappers here it adds excitement I like that but I do want to tell you that it's easier to hear it than it's going to be to do it when you go home why because then you are the one that has to face your feelings and it's always the feelings it's all about the feelings amen we have to learn to stop letting our feelings rule us you can change them by training them the way you train them is the same way you train a spoiled child you let them know you're not the boss and you need to let your emotions know that you have them they don't have you and they're not the boss you are what do you do with a kid that's having a little fit you try to talk to him a little while and then you just say go to your room and have your fit in other words I don't want to listen to it go go somewhere well we need to do that with our emotions just go over there and stand in the corner but don't bother me because I've got a day that God's given me and I'm going to enjoy it wilderness mentality number six <laughs> my behavior may be wrong but it's not my fault 
evading the real issues in life. If you continue my word, you'll know the truth. The truth will make you free. That's one of the first scriptures I read in the Bible when I really became a serious student of the Word of God. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. It's not the truth about somebody else that will make you free. And that's not just talking about this awesome truth. That sounds good. I'll know the truth. But you know what? Honestly and truly, a lot of the truth in here is personally directed at each one of us. It's not just this vague truth. What is truth? I know truth. It's the Bible. <laughs> well, the Bible says you should be quick to forgive. So if you're not, then face the truth. The Bible says that we should not be quick to get angry. Well, if you do have a bad temper, then face the truth, get with God, admit it, I have got a bad temper and I need to change. Help me, God. Don't keep blaming it on somebody else. I have an eight-year-old granddaughter that, oh, it's going to be fun. <laughs> I kind of regret to say that she's like me, totally uncrucified in an eight-year-old body. Oh, man, that girl's got a mouth on her and an attitude. And she's been like that since, you know, since she was old enough to do anything. So it is a personality issue, but it's going to have to be, you know, tempered and, and worked with. And, and um, my daughter will be able to help her because she understands that. She knows that. But Laura's always sending me text messages and telling me things that Emily did. And I got one this morning, and she said... Emily was giving me a hard time this morning, and I told her, you need to stop being, dis stop being disrespectful. She said, well, you need to stop making me mad. <laughs> then she goes to a Christian school, so they get Bible lessons. She comes home tonight and tells her mother, you know what the biggest problem is that we have? And her mother said, what? She said, our mouth. But now here's the funny part. She wasn't applying that to her. <laughs> that didn't even occur to her. It was just like, you know what everybody's problem is? It's their mouth. <laughs> now, you know, it's fun to laugh at little eight-year-old Emily, but we've got some 40-year-old Emilies and some 50-year-old Emilies and, and Fred's and George's and... evading real issues and going around and around and around the same stupid mountains, that means you have a problem, you behave the same way. You have a problem, you get depressed. You have a problem, you get discouraged. You have a problem, you stop going to church, you stop giving, you stop helping anybody. Why, God, why? When, God, when? Why, God, why? When, God, when? Why me? Didn't make any progress, didn't learn anything, didn't grow, so you'll have the problem again. One good thing about God, you never flunk out of His school. If you fail a test, you just get to do retakes. <laughs> you know, some places there's limits. You can only take this test three times, like, your, you know, some exams. It's like if you don't pass, you can take it again, you can take it again, but they do have limits. Well, God has no limits. But don't be taking the same tests when you die and go to heaven. Don't still be in sandbox when you get there or pre-kindergarten or something. Blame. Blame shifting. It's not my fault. If you didn't act that way, then I wouldn't be this way. Well, I act bad because I was abused. I acted bad because Dave was or wasn't doing something. I acted bad because my kids didn't help me. I acted bad because I cleaned up the house and they messed it up. I acted bad because I did all the work and they enjoyed life. I didn't want to enjoy my life because then I couldn't have been a martyr. <laughs> Hello? David say, why don't you 
stop working all the time and come on in here and have fun. Well, I just, I, I can't do that. It's nice for you to play all the time, but somebody's got to do the work around here. <laughs> come on, do I have any relatives in the house? <laughs> I had a bad attitude, bad attitude. We all have an excuse bag we carry it around with us. It's invisible, but we have one. And any time it comes to taking responsibility, we just reach in there and get out an excuse. Every time we have a bad attitude, well, I know I'm grouchy, but I had a bad day at work. No, you're grouchy because you can't go through anything and keep a good attitude. Come on, I'm smiling. <laughs> and I'm talking to me too. I'm not just talking to you. I say you, but not because I don't think I need it too. I say that because I want you to get it personally. We're not grouchy because we had a bad day at work. Now, there's a great temptation to be grouchy if you had a bad day at work, no doubt about that. It makes it harder to have a good attitude if you had a bad day at work. It makes it harder to maintain a good attitude if you spent an hour and a half in traffic when you were hoping to get home in 15 minutes. But have a chat with yourself and just say, get a new attitude. So things are not working out the way you planned. My times are in your hands, God. Don't just sing it in church. Live it. Well, I know I'm acting bad, but I don't feel good. Well, you know, how many people do feel good? A lot of people feel bad. If everybody that felt bad acted cranky all the time, we'd have a real mess, wouldn't we? Come on, smile at me. I'm trying to help you. <laughs> Genesis 3, 12 and 13, it got started early, right in the garden. Blame. And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, God. God, you should have known better to give me that woman. She gave me that fruit. And I ate it. Now, let's just stop right there for just a minute, because I'm just tired of getting the blame for all this apple-eating stuff. First of all, guys, if you'll bear with me just a moment, Adam was the man, the head of the little garden household. And I'm sure that God had told him that they were not to eat the fruit. And so when she ate it and she gave it to him, he should have said right there, woman, you did what? You did what? You better start asking God to forgive you right now. But instead, she batted her pretty eyes at him, and he took the apple and ate. And then as soon as God came to deal with him, which is always the next step, she said, God, that woman you gave me. It's our fault. Let's put the scripture back up. And the man said, the woman that you gave me, she ate from the tree. And I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, okay, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, that serpent <laughs> beguiled and cheated and outwitted and deceived me. And I ate. Adam said it was God's fault and Eve's fault. And Eve said it was the devil's fault. And my whole point is, is nobody was willing to face the truth and say, yep. I really made a big mistake. I'm sorry, God, I take full responsibility. I tell you, even as an employer, there's nothing that really is more frustrating to me than trying to ask somebody what happened in a situation and just getting nothing but excuses, excuses, and blame, blame, blame. I love the people that just say, you know what? I was responsible for that. I should have done it right. I'm sorry, it was totally my fault.
The minute that people do that, it's over. It's just over. It's like everything in you just wants to forgive them and just go on. And all God wants us to do is just take responsibility and admit the truth. Well, God wants us to be patient and not have an attitude that we deserve everything we want right now. Let's learn to be patient while we're waiting. Waiting is not patience. It's how we act while we wait that is the fruit of patience. You know, Mom just had a vision years ago to um, really just, she just thought about people, you know, hurting and not being able to get, you know, care for that. And so she, we just basically started looking around, how can we start helping people? And so we started with hospitals and, you know, we just go, um, you know, five, six times a year to different countries and um, just try to help as many people as we can, try to go to the poorest, most unreached places that we can find, places that really do not have access to medical care and um, just help people. Door ontzendingswerk Hand of Hope ervaren we hoe levens veranderen en harten open gaan. Uw bijdrage, groot of klein, maakt veel uit in het leven van een mens. Hij krijgt daardoor een warme maaltijd, medische verzorging of hoort voor het eerst over Jezus. Help mee om Gods liefde aan zoveel mogelijk mensen door te geven. Ik heb gelijk. Die ander heeft het fout. Eén woord te veel en je hebt een knallende ruzie. En niemand heeft het gedeeld. Het kan ook anders. En ontdek nu hoe. Nu verkrijgbaar van Joyce Meyer. Leven zonder conflicten. Bestel nu het boek Leven zonder conflicten. Via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Ga ook eens naar de Facebookpagina van Joyce Meyer Nederland. Like deze pagina en ontvang elke dag inspirerende uitspraken van Joyce op jouw Facebook. Open, direct en to the point. Kleine oases in je dagelijks leven. Lees mee, het is het waard. Alleen bij Joyce Meyer Nederland op Facebook.